I want to tell you a story that, that, that really illustrates who we are, who we are as a people. Now, who we are doesn't mean it's who we're going to be. And there is a real problem in our country right now with our children. I can't imagine being a teenager today. I can't. I really feel bad for my kids because my kids are dealing with stuff I didn't even think of until I was maybe 40 or honestly, maybe in the last five years. And they're forced to deal with it and make decisions on things. Meanwhile, as they're going through their most awkward time of their life, hey, everybody's got a video camera. Let's catch you on camera to make sure we preserve it and put it online forever. Can you imagine the pressure they're under? I'm a dad just like you, and I don't know how to raise my teenagers. And I'm a dad just like you. If your kids don't listen to you, you know, your wisdom, because it's dad. Let's switch kids for a while, because I'm sure they'll listen to you. If anybody else says stuff, they listen to it. I say it. Mom says it. Nah. You don't know what you're talking about. My kids, your kids, they are adrift in this sea of awful stuff. My son came to me last week and he was talking about things that he's supposed to do. And if it was like taking out the garbage, I would understand, but it's not. Dad, I'm supposed to be successful. Well, what, what does that mean? Who told you that? Well, I mean, you're really successful. I won the lottery, dude. I won the lottery. Well, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to go to this college. And I'm so, I said to him, you're not supposed to do any of that stuff. You're supposed to follow your spirit. You're supposed to take the things that we taught you not throw them away, use common sense, and follow your path. And every time you make a bad decision, you limit your future opportunities. However, once you correct that decision, everything opens up. He, he doesn't know, and I don't think our kids know, who they're supposed to be. My son said to me, I don't know what I'm going to be, Dad. And I said, you know what I want you to be? Do you know what I, I really want you to be? He said, no. I said, happy and decent and kind and giving. Somebody who is full of empathy for others. All of the things that are already inside of him. I don't know how I'm supposed to make money with that. Well, nobody in my family knew how I was going to make money doing this. And I think a lot of the listeners right now are going, I don't know how he makes money at that either. So for people my age, let me tell you who we were. Let me take you back to the summer of 1942. Farmers and children and women lining the streets of small towns. And they're ready to hurl vegetables and abuse at Nazis. This happened in America. They waited for the evil bastards to arrive. Ready to degrade their hulking Nazi villains. But when the Nazi POWs eventually arrived, the townsfolk here in America just stared, mouths open, eyes sunken. The air was silent except for the clip-clop drag of the soldiers' long, long long-worn boots, the sharpened teeth, and the bloodlust stares went away. 
POWs weren't beast-like like the Nazi death soldiers. They weren't even men. Most of them were boys, just like our own. They were muddy, listless, broken, and terrified. They marched to their camps here in America, quietly. Now, the Soviets had parades. June 1944, a horde of Nazi POWs slumped down in the streets of Moscow. 57,000 of them were marching. The story goes that before the Soviets marched the POW, the Nazis, through Moscow, they fed them laxatives and then wouldn't let them stop. Not sure if that's true, but either way, things became very, very verifiably worse for the Nazi POWs in Russia. There were three million taken by the Soviets. Between 300,000 and one million never made it home. They were cruel and brutal. But it was justified, right? Because the Nazis were cruel and brutal to the Russians, unlike we can understand. A decade earlier, the Geneva Convention on Prisoners of War established the rules for housing and care of POWs. And if a nation violates those mandates, they lose those protections. Combatants are no longer required to treat them in accordance with the rules of war if the other country isn't doing it. German and Japanese soldiers violated every single one. Things worse than any nightmare. The Japanese were the worst. So all of the Allied powers were justified in doing whatever they wanted to to these soldiers. And the Soviets were brutal. But this isn't a story of the brutality of the Soviets and the cruelty of the Nazis. It's a comparison of that cruelty about the goodness in Americans. By the end of the war, 425,000 POWs had been housed in 700 camps throughout America. Did you know that? For reference, there were 95,000 Americans that were POWs in Germany. We had 425,000. There were POW camps in 46 of then 48 states. Camp Rockfield in Wisconsin, Camp Ritchie in Maryland, Roswell in New Mexico, Camp Rupert in Idaho, Camp Ogden in Utah, Camp Rustin in the Piney Woods of Louisiana. Texas had 72 camps, the most in America. The POWs entered America through ports in New York and Virginia, and from there they were dispersed. According to U.S. Army POW guidelines, camps had to be far from urban areas for security, places with mild climates. They were mostly located in the South, far from the action of the war, and near farming communities. After all, the country was struggling through a labor shortage, so the POWs were assigned Army surplus fatigues and put to work plowing, tilling, digging, and harvesting. They were actually paid for this work, between 10 and 80 cents per day, which back then was something. And it could be used to buy toiletries and beer. And in their free time, they played soccer and chess, and they sang in choruses and performed in bands and orchestras. They were given three meals a day, and depending on the camp, a beer break in the afternoon. Do a quick Google search for Nazi POW Camps America. You'll be flooded with articles and documentaries and books describing the humane treatment the Germans received while here. A camp in Indiana was billed Eden for enemy prisoners. Camp Hartford in southwest Wisconsin was a converted Art Deco ballroom where before the war, Lawrence Welk had swooned an audience of young Americans. Wonderful, wonderful. There were problems. I mean, it was still war after all. But less than 1% of the 400,000 POWs tried to escape. The camps were supervised mostly by German officers. What surprised Americans, what surprised us most, 
is that fewer than 10% of the POWs were hard, hardcore Nazis. Most of them were German boys and young men who had wound up in the quiet parts of an intriguing nation. And, and now they couldn't believe the size of America. They couldn't believe that you could ride a train for days and still be in the same country. They couldn't believe how vast and how quiet it was here at night. And America changed the men who came here. Franz May was captured by the British in 1943. He was serving in North Africa. He was a young man who knew nothing about the world, including the war that had grabbed it by the neck. Now suddenly he faced two options. He could be sent east to the Soviet Union, where he would most likely die, or west to America. He didn't have a choice, but fate took him west to a camp in the quiet la uh, land outside of Bragg's, Oklahoma. He connected with the people in a way he never had expected. He was grateful for the kindness and hospitality he received. And after the war, he went home to Germany. Then he went to Australia. And he lived his life there with gratitude. Recently, seven decades after leaving America, in 2019, Franz May came back to America. He visited Camp Gruber in Oklahoma. Think about all the millions that have visited other camps all around the world and their reaction. When Franz came to Camp Gruber, he looked at the ransacked land, now a 90-year-old man, and he said, this is what I've always wanted to do, to come home to Oklahoma. We are good people. Now, how do we get there? So in this conversation with my son, I told him, you just have to remember who you are. And then I realized he's, he's not necessarily sure who he is yet. Our kids don't know who they are yet. We know who they are, but they're not. They're not sure. It takes you a while to find that. So Saturday morning, I, I got up and I started reading things that might help him on his journey. And I want to share something that we've all heard before a million times. And we all were forced to read when we were in school, but I know I didn't appreciate it until I was, until I was much later in life. In fact, I appreciate each line differently now than I ever have. It's if. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hatred, hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth that you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and stoop and build them up with worn out tools if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pinch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will that says to them, hold on. 
If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. We are looking for answers everywhere. We are looking, how do we fix our problems? How do I react to my family? How do I react to people? How do I fight these battles? The answers are all around us. And they're, they're all the simple and quiet ones. Just like local is the answer to change the federal actions. The smallest actions, the changes in each of us, and the teaching of these things to our children, the simple things, are the answers to the complex world they're facing today.